Above all, in setting out to do an exhibition called The Homes of Football, I've got to make sure I've catered for the football audience, that they come along and don't think, what's this guy on about? I want them to think he's captured you know, something about our club. As you know, in football, there's a lot of rivalry with, with local teams, and this is our rival team, Motherwell. Actually, being an Airdrie fan, we've got a lot of rival teams because nobody likes us. Uh, but I particularly hate this photograph. I want people to come along and think, um, didn't think I liked football, but this is, this is good, you know, it says something about life maybe, not just football. My name's Mamsie, and I've been a season ticket holder for about four years at Liverpool. I actually hate this picture. I'm sure the fundamental attraction of football is the intrinsic worth of the game. I mean, you can get some trashy football that you can, trashy music or trashy poetry, but when you get good football, it is brilliant. I think some people are surprised um, in the, the Lake District's the base for doing this Homes of Football. See, I view Scotland as, as important almost as England in what I do. And of course, it's almost on the border between the two, so almost alternate weeks in going to the two countries. A good way of getting out of school, I found, was to go into town and uh, draw. I was good at drawing, and I would go and draw every brick of the town hall and spend hours there and justify that I had to spend more time to finish off the building. Uh, and I started thinking uh, that I was good at drawing things at a sort of slow pace, you know, my own pace, but when it came to, to them, I found absolutely fascinating. You have grannies with lipstick slightly smeared or their hair nets and things, and I was looking at them very close up in detail thinking I'd love to sort of get them in on the picture but I couldn't draw quick enough so I thought I'll bring my camera along and uh, this little camera I had and start photographing them. And I guess I just became too lazy to draw, started taking photos. I wanted to travel when I left college. I'd sort of been writing essays and all these boring things and uh, I wanted to take pictures as far flung places as I could but Having said that, mostly around Britain, I wanted to go to every corner of this country. And I did um, jobs for newspapers, Time Out magazine above all, in London, and then some provincial newspapers. One of the great ones that got me, uh, made me convinced that football was this subject to do for 10 years was uh, I was doing like the story of Wet Wet Wet, the pop group, growing up in Glasgow. And I only wanted two pictures, I came back with 70 you know, like, like a picture album of their imagined youth, what it was like for them growing up in Clyde Bank and Glasgow. And so much was football, absolutely ingrained into the nature of Scottish people, perhaps English, but it seemed even more remarkably so there in Glasgow. And then I just said, that's it, I'm going to do this now. I'm going to put down everything else, not going to touch any other subjects now for, until I've told this story of football. I think football in Britain suffered, especially in the 1980s, the terrible tragedies we had, Hillsborough, Bradford, and other occasions, High Soul. And that, to me, especially Bradford and Hillsborough, was the kind of uh, neglected problems of the game coming home to roost. And I suppose there was a kind of, there was a kind of old-fashioned class attitude inbuilt there that these people that go along to football are the old working class and we'll just pack them in like sardines and we'll, we'll just let them stand in the terracings uncovered and if there's a bit of crushing then so what this had been part of the tradition of football for years for decades but it was asking for trouble it was it was crying out to be changed before some tragedy hit it and it wasn't changed I remember seeing Desmond Lyon on the famous TV presenter um, trying, to, trying to put it across for people what had happened and uh, I thought that is you know, a really difficult story to tell. I didn't like the pictures in the newspaper and I kind of understand why does that sort of uh, pictures appear very sensational. I didn't really like those. So I set about trying to show them the creeping disaster that was football in a much more subtle way and then hoping that it would turn the corner and become a great celebration. Bradford and Hillsborough, you know, were just unspeakably horrific. 
but they were coming, they were always going to happen. And it took the deaths of all these people for football and its governors to say, large crowds need to be protected from themselves. Somebody's got to take on the responsibility to start respecting the people that go to the game as much as the players and as much as the officials. And it took those deaths for, for us to realize that we must have proper stadiums with proper facilities. Well, I think it was really, the football grounds had, had uh, grown, grown old, really. They were 100 years old in most cases. They were built in the Victorian era. Generally just a game tired of itself, and yet it really was still in its infancy. The main thing about the Taylor Report, which came in after Hillsborough, a year, almost a year exactly after, was that most uh, at big grounds anyway, terracing should go, so standing should go for seats. And that's an obviously visually a big change, given that people would be sat uh, in seats, you usually then put a roof over their heads, so a lot more stands appeared. Having decided to put all my efforts and all my time and my photography um, talents, if you like, into doing the homes of football in 1989, and having done it now for eight years, um, I've built up quite a record of all the clubs during this period of change in England and Scotland, all the major clubs, some of the smaller ones too. And uh, alongside the, the documentation, which in most cases people don't get to see, um, I've, I've put on an exhibition which they can see, at least the cream of the um, collection of pictures. And I'm adding to that all the time, not just in photos, but you know, other things, memorabilia and sort of sculptural figures even now. There are people that might come here that don't normally go to the game and I think what they'll see is a different face, a different side of football and I think that's important. You see, when we go to the game, you know, we go hours before kick-off, we talk to people, we mingle and say we see ourselves as ambassadors and this in some ways um, it, it represents what we do. I think that the exhibition has been excellent. If you look round about, I mean, you can relate so much to the pictures. I picked this picture here, it's Fir Park, um, home of Motherwell Football Club. Uh, as you know, in football there's a lot of rivalry with, with local teams, and this is our rival team, Motherwell. Actually, being an Airdrie fan, we've got a lot of rival teams because nobody likes us. Uh, but I particularly hate this photograph in a nice manner, if you know what I mean. It's a good photograph, but it's just a pity it's about Motherwell. I think football provides a sense of drama, excitement. It provides a sense of belonging, a sense of allegiance, all the things that I suppose gel a community together. I want the game to continue to be a nationwide thing. I want us to continue to have the beauty and the charm of the very small towns and villages who have their local teams. If they cease to exist, it seems to me the great picture of football would be marred. This is the best ground in the country. <laughs> First time I came here, to the, it was an evening in March and uh, getting slightly dark, and I came over the hill down here running and jogging the four miles with my <laughs> boots in expectation of getting a game. And the only trouble is I was always looking at the mountains and, oh, the ball comes to me, I wasn't ready. <laughs> the 
this is uh, you got this is Anfield and you know um, Manchester United, Old Trafford, but this really is an amazing game. I was born to be a photographer, just as people uh, believe they're born to be a farmer, a fighter pilot, or a footballer. And um, as well as the photographing uh, on a professional level, I believe the essence of photography for all of us is the snapshot album, the picture on the mantelpiece. And um, the first photos, of course, I saw, as anyone, is my mum and dad's pictures, me taking pictures of my cat and my dog and my house. And um, we're trying to always hold on to the passing of time, to capture moments, freeze them forever, so that they um, say we lived here. This was us in this great passing of time. Of tens of thousands of years, this was our little dance in the middle of that great chapter of life. And uh, that's the essence of photography. All right, this is of everyone. Are you all ready? OK, all well, it's right. Yeah. Right on its way. In choosing to do the homes of football in colour and colour photography, um, we do, where we're dealing with photography and football, which are two of the most accessible things to people going. So I'm setting myself up to be having to take better pictures than they would on their own cameras for them to really step back and think, well, you know, I was there too at that, or I had access to that experience, because they're not always from privileged positions in the ground, you know, they're just from the terraces or outside the ground even. They're things that other people could have photographed. And the competitive zeal in me, the streak that runs in all of us, I suppose, thinks, OK, I'm not going to be a mountaineer if I'm the highest mountain, I'm not going to score 100 goals for England, but I'm going to take such pictures that they think, my name is Mandy and I've been a season ticket holder for about four years at Liverpool. I actually hate this picture um, because for a number of things. When I first looked at it, um, because of the, the wall, it, it captures the end of the tunnel. And as soon as I look at it, I actually feel quite suffocated looking at the picture. Um, and also, you know, the emptiness of the terrace. Um, the main thing that struck me about it was because all the crowd at the back and the match playing, it's, it's almost like it's insignificant what happens and sort of life carries on. And we all know life does carry on, but I feel that it, it's showing, oh, well, well, that was yesterday, you know, that's, that's out the way now, it's forgotten. Um, OK, when's the next football match and everybody's packed in the other end? And that picture sort of captures all those feelings in one. Well, this is my favourite picture out of the whole exhibition. Um, I really like this one because I feel as though I'm almost in there myself. If you forget the fact that they're wearing Leeds jerseys, it could almost be anyone. Um, I like the closeness, there's anticipation, there's joy. It's, it, the, the body language speaks volumes. I think it's a tremendous photo. I want the photographs to make people smile. Uh, humour in the pictures, it's humour in, in life and certainly at football grounds, in the crowds, in the funny little characteristics littered around the grounds that uh, have survived changes in some cases or, or have disappeared. They make you laugh sometimes just for the fact that they've disappeared and you think, crikey, was that at our ground until so recently? It was Airdrie's last ever game at Broomfield. Um, it was closing down then. They'd sold it to Safeway. And I'd known for a number of months that I was going to this match. It was Airdrie versus Dunfermline. And uh, I went there with my dad and my brother as usual. Stood in the same spot that I stood for years. And uh, we beat them firmly. <laughs> you know, we stopped them winning the league, so what a way to finish at Brunfield. But uh, it didn't really strike me until the final whistle when everybody invaded the pitch. And I just stood there and I was sort of froze to the spot I was standing. The next thing I knew, I was crying, the tears were streaming in my face. You know, it's the last time I'm going to be in Brunfield. <clears throat> Watching everybody ripping the place apart was amazing. You know, and they were like, there was a part of me out there, but I couldn't move, I was just stuck. Um, but anyway, that night, after I'd been home for the football, I was driving down past. And I happened to look into Broomfield, and above the terrace and above the roof was a big place for the TV cameras. And I seen all these lads with a big flag and they were having a bevy. And I happened to walk in and see, and there was about 40 a side going on in the pitch. 
you know, and uh, apparently the police had tried to move them on, and the directors here did come out and let them play. They gave them a ball and said, just let them enjoy themselves. It's their ground. They've came to watch their team. And it was just the final swan song was unbelievable. Part of me says that, you know, we're sad to leave here tonight. The other part says, obviously, we've got to move to new facilities because we, we sadly like facilities here. The supporters, the area supporters, they're obviously pretty passionate about this place. Well, as you can see for yourself, there's very little left of Broomfield tonight. And I come to a game and I come, on the, come in the car and, and I wander around more than most because I like taking pictures, but what was it like in the 1930s or 40s, say, you, you with your mates coming to the match, what was it like? Well, yeah, as I say, we, it was a, a, a regular meet-up as early and we'd, we'd probably have a game at Snooker together and they'd allow visiting supporters in and then you'd get generalising on, uh, on how, how their team were playing instead of, he looks a fine player, your left wing is bang on form like we'll have to watch him today and say him about about ours but you don't get too much now did you sing more then in those days did we what in the 50s 40s 30s sing sing more oh, you sing. Uh, did you swear people make yeah, it your angels no. in your day oh can you swear no, you I never said never said with that no you didn't you, 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 don't, all, you all swear when it miss a sitter don't you you always say yeah. oh dear that was close yeah <laughs> tell i'm amazed you know when i think all my generation now when we see those you, both of you are saying, <coughs> Jack and Ted, you're saying about this swaying and swaying and, and how people carry 20 yards down and then and come back, back up again. Yeah. I, I, you know, I can't believe that people didn't get injured. Did. When you look back at it, it makes you wonder. There used, when to, be, you there used to be a couple of St John's ambulance men knocking back and if, if one did get a shout, it, mm -hmm. yeah. pass him down. Looking back, you, come back. you can't recall too many, you can't recall too many Injuries, looking back, when you think yeah. about it. When the cop were first converted, it looked good, so we thought we'd come and have a seat. Mm -hmm. Now, it was great to sit down before the match started, yeah. but the first 20 rows, when the team was pressing down this side, you get an awful lot of people stand up, so obviously it was like the Mexican way. People you behind automatically had to stand up. But if it's too late, either ball would just miss or in net, and then you think, crack it. But I think here uh, you took a lot of atmosphere from football. It's like taking a tap room out of a pub. You generally lose that kind of atmosphere. A lot of people like the tap room atmosphere of a pub rather than all sat down sedately in a lounge. And that's what you, you've done by making all seats. And a lot of my mates said the same. You can't be at the old atmosphere where all we used to be together, heaving and swaying. As a teenager and a young man on the spine cop watching your side when they used to be kicked towards spine cop. That was the place to be. And I think we've just lost that, that edge. With safety and with pristine arenas, the atmosphere at football has diminished. The fantastic old raucous atmosphere, reverberating cries and, and songs and chants, I think that aspect of the game has been lost because in the all-seated stadiums you, you don't get the, the old breathy roar that you used to get when 25,000 will be packed onto one terracing end. But I'm pretty happy if, if, if the price that we pay for that loss is safety and comfort, then I think uh, that's a good thing. Seven years ago when I began the homes of football, I never once had to ask the way to a football ground because the floodlights um, would always tell you where the ground was. But as in the case here at Anfield, they've tucked them in under the new stand roof and you can't see it. There's no mistaking you're in a football community when you get close to the ground with the noises, kids shouting out their football allegiances and, um, of course, <laughs> the smashing of gates and things as football is played out.
I think football should still believe and still hope that it belongs to the people. And these are the communities that surround the clubs. Um, and you see this at the big city clubs. You see it at Rangers, you see it at Celtic. It's very noticeable at, at Liverpool, at Anfield, at Villa Park, where Aston Villa play. These grounds are cheap by jowl with the, with the housing estates, where the community lives, where the people are. And I like that symbolism. I love seeing the bricks and mortar of the vast new stadiums rising up above the, the, the local communities where the people live. It symbolises to me the true heart of football. And it symbolises for me the umbilical link between the club and the people that support the club and finance the club. And that, for me, confirms that football belongs to the people, the community. And I hope that in the radical changes that are overtaking football, that umbilical cord is never severed. I think what it does is uh, it reminds you of, of like instances or funny stories or I remember going to that game or I remember walking up there or I've been to that ground. So, and, and most of it is, is good feelings because we all go to football because we want to see our team win. But we also, it's the excitement before you go, the build up, you know, who's playing today, who's on the subs bench, picking your team in your own mind. And uh, all those emotions, when you look at pictures, it just reminds you of, of something that you love because you're going to a football match. I think um, it gives people who don't have an interest in football to see a different side, to see a humorous side, to see the passion, um, to see the collective coming together, regardless of which team you support or what your views are. And uh, I think that's important to broaden the view because normally your Joe Blogs in the street who doesn't follow football will only see and hear the adverse side. And there's much, much more to it. And there's a lot of unemployment in Liverpool. There's a lot of badness going on, you know, whatever's happening here and there. You read about in the papers, a guy was shot, a guy was stabbed. But when you go to football on a Saturday, that's all out the window. You forget about that. You know, you can follow up your wife on a Friday night, have the biggest row of your life. If you go to football on a Saturday, you have a couple of beers, you relax, you forget about it. You come back home, all right, if your team's won, you're a wee bit more lenient with the wife, you fall back in there easier. But if they've lost, then you're back to square one. But to me, football, it's, it's life, you know. You can go away and forget your worries for an hour and a half, two or three hours in the pub, whatever. Um, and this just sums it up for me. I mean, I've picked this picture, but there's a lot of pictures in here. I think one's better than the next. But it just sums up life, football. It's amazing. I've never grown weary of doing the homes of football and uh, putting on the exhibitions. And uh, I think having people around you all the time is a great incentive to keep doing it. Uh, trying to build a little team of people that would take it on for uh, a few years more. When you get guys who have a common passion, or as we're now getting women as well who have a common passion, that, when it's cleansed of sectarianism or bigotry, is, is terrific. I, mean, I wouldn't put football on a par with the NHS or religion or anything like that, but it's pretty important in people's lives, and I can appreciate why. It's vastly popular because of the intrinsic worth of the thing, the beauty of the thing. Hiya, how are you doing? Alright, good to see you. It's not a great day for a picture, but uh, first day of the season. Who would have thought it was great? Come on, let's go and see what we're getting into.